Welcome everybody to Aaron's Audio Corner, another wonderful episode of Subble for Testing. Today on the test bench, we have the SVS PB2000 Pro. Let's do this. Couple basic facts about this subwoofer. It is a 12 inch sub and it is a ported enclosure. It does come with a grill, as you see here, made out of pretty thick plastic, which just snaps into place. As you can see, the subwoofer comes in a black ash finish and it comes with dual three inch ports. It also ships with elastomeric feet. And you can use these to set the subwoofer down on top of to help reduce any kind of vibration through the floor or something like that. Now I didn't use these because I didn't have a need for them in, in my room. So I actually just left them in the box. You don't have to use these, but you can. And some people might have a need for them. I could probably see that being if you have a, like a hard concrete floor, um, tile, hardwood, something along those lines, it might be more useful. They're not that large. If you wanna take a look at them, pretty neat little design. And you can see that they're threaded on the inside. So you take the OEM feet off and then you just thread these in place and there you go. We'll quickly walk through some of these features that are on the back of the subwoofer. You can see the input output, standard line level input RCA. There is no XLR for this subwoofer. There is a USB plug-in for a wireless adapter if you wanted to place this somewhere and you didn't wanna to have to or you couldn't be able to run RCAs into it. And then here is the standard. You've got the low pass, you've got the phase, and you can adjust these just by pushing up and down. They do have some blue light indicators instead of the typical dials that most subwoofers have. Another extra I really liked about this subwoofer is the Bluetooth app. So when I first got this in, I was looking at the back of it and I thought, okay, I'm gonna to have to get some kind of Bluetooth accessory to plug into this thing to make it work. And that's not true. The amp itself already has the Bluetooth connection there. So all you gotta do is fire up your phone, download the app, connect, which is super easy, and you're set. So you can control parametric EQ, level, phase, et cetera, directly from your app, rather than having to run back and forth between the subwoofer and your seated position, which is a great thing when you're trying to fine tune a subwoofer into a system. You, you can just sit in your main listening position and control your app and make adjustments on the fly and understand how it's gonna relate to your seated position rather than doing it all from the amplifier, then running back to your seat and hoping that that solution works well. As you can see, the subwoofer enclosure has not only one, but two cross braces. The front one is a magnet structure support, which I personally really like. I think that's a great added touch. And then the second one is probably your standard structural rigidity cross brace. And on the sidewalls, you have some white, thick, pretty dense acoustic material. And another thing that I liked was that the speaker leads themselves are also coated in some kind of foam to help keep down any sort of internal rattlings or resonance, anything of that nature. All in all, a very nice solid construction with some extra thought put into bracing that I really appreciate. First thing we're gonna start off with is the frequency response. What we have here is the frequency response measured from my Clipple machine. This was done in the ground lane as are all my other tests. And this is the actual raw data. And what we can see here is a pretty good linearity until about 50 hertz. And then at 50 hertz is when the roll off starts to begin. And this area right here around 25 hertz is about a two or three dB drop in relation to the overall trend line. So if you were just to draw an imaginary line right through here, this would be about two or three dB down from that line. I'm not sure what's causing that. I, I actually retested this subwoofer on a separate day just to make sure that nothing funky was going on with the setup or with the weather or anything like that. And then I got the same result. And I also noticed that Audioholics had tested this. James Larson from Audioholics had tested this. And if you look at his results, even though it's not the same scale, it looks a little bit uh, less standout-ish, he still has a dip right around that same frequency. One question everybody wants to know, how does this compare to the Monoprice Monolith? So what I've got here is the Monolith response. I'm gonna copy it from my previous test. And this is the Monolith 12 THX ported mode, so wide open ported, and it's the THX EQ version instead of the extended EQ. And I'm gonna drop it on top of here. I'm gonna color it red. I'm gonna blow this up. I'm gonna call it what it is, Monolith 12 ported THX EQ, okay? 
first off, do not compare the actual levels because every amplifier has different input sensitivity and the gain is going to be a little bit different. So can't really compare the levels, but let's just kind of observe the general trends here. The monolith is more linear throughout its operating range. But if you do want to compare directly, what I've done is I've exported this data into text file and I have opened it up in REW. So I have level matched the two in about the 70 to 100 hertz region. So you can see they actually match up quite well, but below 60 hertz is where the difference starts to appear with the SVS being about 2 dB lower until you get to this 25 hertz region again, where the delta between this point on the SVS and this point on the mono price is what, about what, four, four to four to five dB, give or take. And that's where the mystery is. So I'm not sure what's really causing that. Aside from the frequency response is the group delay. So I've measured group delay. And in general, I know a lot of people want to know about group delay because they think that it gives the subjective terms such as immediacy or attack or fall off, those kind of things, transients. I'm not sure at what point this becomes audible and it's it's said to be related to the actual frequency. I know at one point I kind of had a handle on this, but it's been so long. And given that it's not a complete science as far as I know, and if I'm wrong, please comment in the comment section and provide evidence and a white paper or something of the sort that you know actually has science and, and data to back this up. But with that said, what I do pay attention to is the group delay near a crossover region. And I want to make sure that it's at least somewhat linear. I don't necessarily care about the value itself, but I care about how smooth the response is in group delay. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're going to cross over at 80 hertz, which most people do. If you go in here and look, there is a rise around 80 hertz, but it's not bad. I mean, it's it's pretty linear, especially, you know, if you compare it to the mono price monolith, they operate pretty much at the same ballpark, uh, but the SVS does have a slope to it and increasing until about, you know, 40 Hertz or so. And then it kind of takes off below that, but, you know, give or take an octave of 80 Hertz. So 80 Hertz to 40 Hertz or 80 Hertz to 160 Hertz. It's in the same ballpark. They're about, let's see, I think two milliseconds apart. And when you're comparing this kind of data to me, it's kind of it's a shrug like, okay, because when you put it in the room, a lot of things are going to happen. When you put it, you know, when you add EQ, you're going to add a whole lot of group delay to the signal itself. And you do have the option of various crossover filters if you have DSP. And so it's worth keeping those kind of things in mind. Not a big deal at the crossover region below that. Do some, do some research and you guys feel free to let me know what you find. If you find anything there, I'll be happy to read it and study up on it and uh, try to refresh my memory. Now let's switch over to the CEA 2010 results. I do CEA 2010 testing for two different methods, which is the CEA 2010A and the CEA 2010B. Each have their own defined set of distortion thresholds. So the tests are completely different. Currently, I am the only one that offers the CEA 2010B testing. Everybody else is doing A. And we're going to look at the results. You can see the table here for A. And then if you go over to B, you can see this table. What I would recommend that you do, if you're curious about how uh, how the subwoofer compares, and I know, again, everybody's been asking, how does this compare to the monolith? So we're just gonna do a comparison. Let's look at the numbers. Now, worth noting is in the black is the CEA 2010A standard, because that's all it calls for testing is 20 through 63 Hertz. Other outlets have tested lower and above. So I'm doing that, but I'm noting those separately as a different color and calling that out specifically that they are actually not part of the standard. So well, I've got the numbers here, but to make life easier, I've got these numbers that correlate to this graph. So we're going to look at the graph and in blue is the mono price monolith. And in red is the SVS. And you can see that the SVS is lower by about one DB or maybe two DB. Let's see. Yeah. About two DB above what 50 Hertz. And the, SVS is about one dB higher below 40 Hertz down to 25 Hertz, but below 25 Hertz is where the monolith really kind of has the advantage there. And that's for the CEA 2010 a testing. So let's do the same thing for the CEA 2010 B testing. Here are the raw numbers. Here is the calculated CEA 2010 B broadband peak SPL 115 for the monolith 
113 for the SVS. So the SVS is just about 2 dB SHA. And if you want to look at this output in graphical format, here you go. Obviously, I'm not testing down to 12 or 16 hertz because this standard does not call for that. And since I'm the only one testing this way right now, I'm going to set the precedent that I'm not going to test below the standard. 20 hertz, the SVS is about, what is that, 103 to 106, so about 3 dB lower. And then at about 31, it's about maybe 1 dB higher. But then when you get above 50 hertz, the SVS is about 2 dB or so, probably on average, maybe 2 to 3 on average lower. So again, the monoprice monolith in terms of max SPL is about, I'm just going to say 2 dB on average higher. Now, for those of you that are curious, I have disconnected the SVS subwoofer from the internal amplifier, and then I ran an impedance sweep on it just so we could kind of see what the tuning frequency is here. We can see that if I set my cross cursor on in the Clipple software, go to zero degrees phase, and that lines up with the bottom of the impedance drop right here, that is about 22 hertz. So the tuning frequency is about 22 hertz on this subwoofer enclosure. And to be a little bit extra, I took the subwoofer drive unit out of the enclosure and I tested it on the Clipple test stand to get the TS parameters, which I'm not going to share, but I can tell you that the average sensitivity of this woofer is at about 85 to 86 dB. But what I was more curious about was the maximum excursion. Per the IEC standard, the linear throw for this subwoofer using the 20% overall distortion threshold is 13.8 millimeters one way. So roughly 14 millimeters one way, which is a pretty respectable number. It's not the longest throw I've ever seen, not the longest linear throw I've ever seen, but with its sensitivity being at around the mid eighties, that's right on par with what I would consider a good raw drive unit. So they started off with a good base in this drive unit itself, just FYI. And that's gonna do it for the objective data. Now with all the subwoofer testing that I do, I always am listening for any sort of resonances or extraneous port chuffing that might bother somebody. I do this when I'm testing outdoors and then when I bring it indoors, I do a little film for you guys. Now, the problem with doing the filming indoors is that all the sounds that you're gonna be hearing are part of the room. And in most cases, it's gonna be the windows rattling or, or something hitting the wall, anything like that. But you'll have to rely on me to tell you if I'm hearing resonance coming from the enclosure or port chuff noise that might be annoying. And with that said, let's kick this test off. I'm using Room EQ Wizard. I've got the frequency set to 120 hertz, and I put the volume at a decent volume, but not too loud as to hurt my ears even when I'm wearing hearing protection. So let's kick this off. I'd say we're good at least until 40 hertz and I can take my hearing protection off. Now I can listen more for the subwoofer because hearing with the hearing protection on low frequency vibration is going to be a little bit tougher. So here we go, 40 hertz. Okay, what I'm hearing is when I get to about 28, 27 hertz, that's when I can hear the port start to take over more. Uh, when you get below that, below 25 hertz, that's when the port is really... Uh, kind of doing its thing around there. As far as port chuff noise, I don't hear any unless I'm sitting right in front of the subwoofer a couple feet away, and that's not a problem. Pretty much every subwoofer is going to be doing that when you're you know, hitting it pretty hard with a lot of output and you're sitting right next to it directly in front of the ports. But in a typical living room, you're not going to have any issues with that. So overall, I give this an A. Uh, the enclosure is very, very well braced, well damped. All in all, I'd say it's a pretty solid subwoofer. I have no problem recommending it. It's certainly an option if you're looking for one in this price range. It has a lot of great output. Although it doesn't quite reach the same levels as the Monolith 12, it does have the Bluetooth app, which I really like. I think it's great. Uh, the three extra bands of PEQ is a really nice thing to have, especially if you're somebody who doesn't already have DSP. I appreciate you watching. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed this. And that's gonna do it for me. You guys have a good one. Peace.